Good morning. morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I heard a story. (laughs) You've been here before. About a church kind of like ours. Small to medium-sized church. Seemed like they got the mission. They got the vision. They got the idea. They knew what church was supposed to be. A church is supposed to be a body of believers that build one another up and then radiates out into the community, spreading the gospel message and feeding people in word and deed. Sounds simple, right? Well, it seemed that there were a growing number of people in that church that, well, that just wasn't good enough for them. They wanted to be a big church. They wanted to be a mega church, and the pastor would always say, guys, aren't you reading the news? Don't you see what's going on? We just create problems when we try to do that. But they would insist, and he would bring up all these arguing points against it. Well, you know what? You know me, right? Like, we hang out. You can get a meeting anytime you want. Well, if we're a mega church, you might not even know me anymore. That's what happens. And then what does that do to you? And what does that do to me? But they persisted. And they had all these different ideas. And the pastor kind of shoot them all down. Finally, they came up with an idea that sounded good. He said, let's get a celebrity worship leader here. And we'll have them. And then everyone from everywhere will come. And the pastor's like, okay, slow down. A couple problems with that. Well... <laughs> A celebrity worship leader is kind of an oxymoron when you really think about it. Just saying. But here's the thing. The only people who know about this worship leader are Christians. And if they're Christians, they're probably already at another church. So what are we saying? That we want to get people from other churches to come here? Aren't we supposed to reach the lost, like new people? So why do we keep doing that, stealing other people's sheep, but they kept persisting. And we really need this to happen. Guys, you got to stop. We're going to have them here one Sunday, and then we can't afford to keep them here, so then the people aren't going to come back when he's not here. They persisted. So he finally relented. For now, you go ahead, advertise this thing, do what you're going to do. So they do. They advertise it. Sure enough, the day came. Pastor's in his office, and it's a church like ours, and if we're being honest, like, you know, 10 o'clock service, people come at 10.05, 10.15. Not you guys, though. You guys are pretty awesome. <laughs> so, you know, it's like that, but it's 9.30. The pastor's in his office. He looks out his window, and here's how you know I'm not talking about me. I don't have a window in my office, so I don't jump out. Anyway, <laughs> he looks out the window of his office, and the parking lot is completely full. People are parking on the grass, ruining the irrigation. Anyway, that's a Southwest Florida problem. It, it's just packed. So he goes, checks out the auditorium. Tons of people. It's usually half full, like it is right now. Or is that? Half, yeah, that was a positive way to look at it. He goes in the auditorium. It's totally full. Standing room only. Unbelievable. And you got to admit, or he had to admit, he's kind of disappointed. Why isn't it like this every Sunday for the Lord? So he goes back in a back room where the worship team, some people would call this a green room. There's nothing wrong with that. Worship team should pray, gather their thoughts. It can be a little nerve-wracking, especially if you're new. So you know, they're back there praying. Celebrity pastor's back there, and he's encouraging them, giving them some tips and advice. And so the pastor goes up to the regular worship leader, and he says, you're going to lead the songs today. Celebrity pastor says, wait a minute, am I still going to get paid? Pastor says, yeah, you're going to get paid. They do the service. Regular worship team, okay. Some people are like, "Eh, what's going on here? I thought this guy was supposed to be here. Second song, people start leaving. Wow, thought we were here to worship the Lord. Third song, more people leave. Pastor gets up. Preaches his regular message, finishes his message, and says, well, now that everyone who came to worship the celebrity worship leader, now that they've left, 
To those of you who came here to worship the Lord, let me introduce to you our guest singer who will be leading us in our last song. Yeah. So <laughs> today we find ourselves in the rest of the story. We saw how Jonah was the perfect Easter story. You can go and watch these messages online. Kind of interesting. We see that prophets weave their way through the accounts of the kings. And so today we're going to arrive at Amos. And I'm stuttering because, <laughs> because Amos is difficult. You've been in church for a long time. Very hard and challenging book to do right, to do the right way. So <laughs> to a lot of you, if you've stayed here as we are on this journey to try to become a true Bible-believing church, not a program church, but a people church, a lot of you don't really need to hear this. So for a lot of you, this should stand as affirmation from God's word. So that's what I want it to be for you. If you get this and you know, you're like, Pastor, stop it. We know affirmation. We're here. And the word of God talks about it. So we're going to talk about it. Right? So sometimes you think, eh, I don't need that right here in your Bible. I got it. I got it. Affirmation. There may be some of you who need to hear this today. And it's going to be a tough pill to swallow, so get ready, maybe online as well. So here we are, 2 Kings 14. Yep, we're here again because there's a lot of different people here. So we arrive at a place where there's Jeroboam the second. So the first one's the first wicked king of Israel. He sets up doubling down Aaron's sin with the gold calves. Well, this is Jeroboam II. It gets confusing because a lot of Bible versions don't say that. They just say Jeroboam, and you're like, what happened? Did he, like, rise from the dead or something? No. Jeroboam II. We saw that Amaziah is assassinated, and now Uzziah becomes king. And so we'll talk about him next week. I'm inserting Amos right here. Why? It doesn't say anything if you're reading along 2 Kings 14 about Amos. But if we go to Amos 1.1, this message was given to Amos. A shepherd from the town of Tekoa in Judah, he received this message in visions two years before the earthquake when Uzziah was king of Judah and Jeroboam II, the son of Jehoash, was king of Israel. There he belongs. And so that's how you know he goes there. Now, I'm not going to read all nine chapters to you, or should I? We can make some changes. Some of you are up for it. <laughs> I'll summarize it for you. It's interesting. Amos is very interesting. The problem here, he's from Judah. God sends him to Israel, right? So you're proclaiming these judgments, these warnings, and this is what the prophets do, and they often get treated horribly. But Amos is very, very interesting because... It's kind of like the reverse of what we see in other prophets. So there's a pattern to the prophets. Usually what happens is they're commissioned somehow. Right? So they're commissioned like Isaiah, for example. He has his commissioning. We see that in Isaiah 6. It happens to all of them. Ezekiel, it seems, in several very strange ways. They get commissioned. They're told what to do. Sometimes they protest. <laughs> but they end up going to Judah and or Israel. To tell them, look, you've been worshiping idols. If you don't stop, I'm going to rain the judgment down on you. And sometimes, like Isaiah, it's like a courtroom case. It goes back and forth and back and forth. A lot of complaining, and it sounds kind of repetitive. Most of the time, it's idol worship, injustice a little more so in Amos. Then, <laughs> the prophet will turn to the other nations. A lot of people don't understand this. God uses other nations, other peoples, to punish Israel and Judah. That's what happens. So he sends them to attack them. Well, the Lord will then turn to them and say, yeah, but you're evil too. You're bad too. Obadiah, don't gloat, right? So the Edomites. So he'll do that sometimes. Then you'll see that there's like a time of restoration. It kind of ends on a happy note most of the time. Yes, I'm going to punish you corporately. Seems like for a long time, but then I'm going to restore you and build you up. Well, in Amos, it's a little bit different. He ends up 
pronouncing judgment against other nations first. It's kind of interesting. So the whole first chapter to Damascus. So Aram, remember Ben-Hadad and Haziel? Haziel, they're both mentioned here, the guy that suffocated Ben-Hadad, and then he does a weird thing, names his kid after the guy he killed. Oh, that's weird, right? So you, <laughs> the Philistines, to Tyre, to Edom, so these different nations. You have Ammon, and then second chapter, Moab, then finally he gets to Judah and Israel, mentions of the idol worship. But the shift is really to the main problem here. In Israel, he calls them fat cows. <laughs> they're, they're kind of comfortable in their wealth, and they're doing things like taking bribes, heavy taxation, and so these rich people are ignoring the poor and the oppressed, but they continue oppressing them. It's not a good thing. This seems to be kind of the main issue here in Amos. You get to chapter 7, and you might get confused because there's a guy named Amaziah who comes into the account, and you might be thinking, wait, isn't Amaziah dead, assassinated? Diff it's possible, like we do here too today, two different people can have the same name. So Amaziah, it's kind of like not quite Joe Smith, right? So he comes into the account, a different guy, that's a priest. And he's saying, stop. And it's kind of interesting just to stop here and think about what happens, the exchange. So first of all, he tells on Jeroboam II <laughs> what he's doing. Comes back to Amos and he's like, look, go back to the professional prophets, the celebrity worship leaders in Judah. But Amos makes the point, no. I'm not a professional, as we saw. I'm a shepherd. I also take care of sycamore fig trees. Interesting thing. Anyway, he tells him, no, I'm not a professional at this. I'm here to pronounce judgment. And then continues to pronounce judgment. Chapter 8, we'll go back to this in a little bit. A famine of the word of the Lord. Really interesting. Nine, back to pronouncing the judgment. And then it ends with this really beautiful poetry. You're not even going to be able to keep up with the harvest when I restore you. Wine will be flowing everywhere. And it kind of just ends like that. Nine chapters. We can dig deeper at Bible study. At the center of this book, some important key verses that you may have heard of in church before, maybe not. He talks about the day of the Lord. Now, the day of the Lord can mean a couple of different things. The day of the Lord can mean this more immediate judgment that's going to happen, or it can mean like what we read in Revelation, like the end of the earth itself and the new heavens and the new earth. Seems a little more immediate here. Oh, you're asking for the day of the Lord, right? So they're holy and righteous. Oh, yeah, you're holy. You want the day of the Lord to come soon, the day of the Lord. <laughs> you don't know what you're asking for. A lot of Christians today need to think about that. Be careful with Maranatha. That's a scary thing. And so that's what Amos is saying. You better be right. The day of the Lord ain't going to be light like you think it is. It's going to be dark. And he means for you, if you're acting like this, Amos 5.21. Now remember, this is God speaking through Amos, not Pastor Gene. I hate all your show and pretense, the hypocrisy of your religious festivals and solemn assemblies. That should be in quotes. I will not accept your burnt offerings and grain offerings. I won't even notice all your choice peace offerings. Away with your noisy hymns of praise. I will not listen to the music of your harps. Instead, I want to see a mighty flood of justice, an endless river of righteous living. Now, there's a context and a concept. Too often in church, people go like that, right? So we take some verses out of the prophets that benefit us, oh, I don't know, like Jeremiah, and, and we, we attach them out of context. And so there's a concept, but doesn't belong. So what I want to do is I parse that out for you. Context. I gave that to you. What's going on here? You have these bad Israelites, right? idol worship, and then also just cheating people, being very dishonest with money, 
Right? They're very comfortable. So this is kind of like, in a modern context, right? If I put it over here, kind of like Naples, Florida. Yep. Right? We think we're living righteously. So we're going to go somewhere, feed a bunch of people, make sure we get the selfie. That's very important. And then go back to our luxurious homes. Wow. Right? Hard. That's the concept. That's the concept. And so if we're doing all this religious stuff, right? It doesn't happen because we're always like, oh, the temple worship or oh, the traditional church, right? So we can always like deflect. <laughs> well, that's why we don't have an altar and we don't do incense or we don't do the, uh, yeah, but right. We go out and like pretend to love poor people. Same thing. Same thing. So, religiosity. But if we're doing all this stuff, right? But we're not really genuine about it. We're not really loving people. It's lip service. Right. And the Lord doesn't want to hear it. It's not real worship. Now, here's the thing I've heard people do. But, uh, uh, Pastor, you got to, I'll teach you about context as if I don't know. It's in the Old Testament, right? And you just said we're not under the law. That's an Old Testament thing. Oh, thank you very much. God thought of this one already. And so did his apostles. Because they remember to regurgitate certain things to you when it's really important. First Peter. He's talking about Christian behavior, which is really important. Honoring authorities, even if they're like Nero, who's burning you alive. Honor him. Wow. Right? So slaves, let's put that in modern-day context. Employees, honor your employers, even if they're being hard on you. Turn the page. Chapter 3, wives, honor your husbands. At, don't forget, husbands, too, honor your wives. Then to all Christians, 1 Peter 3, 8, finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other, love each other as brothers and sisters, be tender-hearted, and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Even on the Facebook, my words, not God's, but I think the intention is correct. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. For the scriptures say, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right and his ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. Peter is quoting and reaffirming God's word from a psalm, a worship song. This is what he's quoting, Psalm 34, 12. Does anyone want to live a life that is long and prosperous? Then keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. His ears are open to their cries for help. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. Peter was being nice because he left this out. He will erase their memory from the earth. So what this means is that the New Testament, the best commentary we have on the Old Testament, is reaffirming a concept. And saying, this is important. Pay attention. This is important. Now, here's the sad part. It's really important. It's from a psalm. Like, we have better worship songs here. Anyway, it won't probably make its way into a modern worship song anytime soon. Because it's not popular. So you're not going to hear it at the popular church. I mentioned last week... And I wanted to talk about it. I think I said that I would talk about it. Maybe a two-part thing. I've got to hear it once in a while. It's out there. It's been difficult. About the megachurch. If you're still here, it's not our objective to be a megachurch. 
And so if you're here, you know that. That is not our objective. People have come in, and sometimes they have a meeting with me in the office, and they're, they're like, are you associated with the other C3? I'm like, no, we're not. Because <laughs> there are a lot of them. We're not associated with anybody like that. It's not our objective. We just want to be a family church. So we get that. Now, most of the time, we apply this to the celebrity pastor. Right? And now you, a whole bunch of people come to mind, right? The guy has like the nice smile. <laughs> you know, so you, you think of a, of a celebrity pastor immediately. And then when you're thinking of scandals, you think of the pastor. We apply that to the pastor. He falls from grace, blah, 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 blah. That's the mega church. We're in Amos today. So we're going to be talking about the worship. A lot of people don't think about this. And they see the worship leaders in like a different category. In other words, it's the celebrity pastor. That's it. Like nobody else was an accessory to this or an accessory to this. Nobody else was involved. Right? So the worship band, what do they do? They leave the church. They start their own thing. And we're good. No problems here. Really. Let me tell you something. I've been a part of worship team, so that's how I started. My wife and I, my family, we came here, business people, not to this building, different building, same church, came here as business people. The Lord drug me into ministry like one of the prophets. <laughs> not as bad, though. Please don't set me on fire or stone me to death. But anyway, put me in a ministry, and I started in the worship ministry, and I worked my way through that, got discipled, became a pastor, cried a lot through that process. <laughs> Former megachurch pastor, that's who's laughing. <laughs> so I'm going to get a lot of affirmation from him today. It's also in the worship ministry. I've seen it. I've played at big churches. I've seen what goes on. It's kind of interesting. Maybe you've noticed something. If you watch any of these big churches online, I bet you never see anyone on the worship team mess up. Never. You know why? They're paying them. That's why. They're professionals. You're not looking at a church family or what we do here, like you. You're singing. You know, that's it. That's how Carolee's like, yeah. <laughs> you're singing. She's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's it. I don't know. Who can sing? Good. Get on the stage. Let's go. Lead the people in worship. Like, no, 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 no. You're paid to be perfect. You cannot mess up. It's in the worship team, too. And it's labeled as ministry. Uh-huh. It's a lot of money in salaries. You know what else is expensive? And it's also labeled as ministry? Wardrobe. Try this. Go to a celebrity pastor's page, right? And then scroll. When you scroll mine, like, you're not going to go too far. You'll see this shirt again. It's going to happen, <laughs> which I buy with my money, by the way, right? So that's it. It'll keep rotating, right? So same shirt, same shirt, same shirt. Yeah. So I, I think I got it to six months now. I'm doing pretty good. Spent too much money. Anyway, <laughs> same shirt, right? You're going to see that. Try it with a celebrity pastor. See if you can catch him wearing the same clothes, same shoes, same shoes, uh-uh. Different sneakers, different sneakers, $2,000 a pair. Now look at this, not a joke. Look at the worship team. Oh, uh oh same thing happening. The instruments, you know what a Gretsch White Falcon is? You ever see a pretty white guitar that most of them all have to play? Well, look that up. It ain't cheap. But I bet you could do the job with a guitar like a fraction of the price. Uh-huh. But no, 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 no. You have to have all the best shiny stuff. That's in the worship budget. Millions of dollars to create those productions. Crazy money. So here's where the leaders are wrong. They shouldn't be letting that happen. And that's true. But, well, it's a parental role. Right? A lot of people have heard this from me. No. Can we? No. 
right? So all parents here, you got to say no. And then if you made the mistake of not saying that, yeah, <laughs> you paid the price for that. Remember the golden calf. I mentioned Jeroboam's. Aaron, Exodus 32. You might know the story, right? So Moses up on Mount Sinai, he's getting the Ten Commandments, right? The initiation of the law comes down. Well, he doesn't come down yet. God tells him, yo, your boy Aaron's going crazy down there with the people. I'm going to kill them all, right? What does Aaron do? The people come to him, and Aaron doesn't go, no. They say, where's Moses? He doesn't say, be patient, shut up. Just sit there, whatever. No. Nope. Moses is gone. You need to make gods for us so we can worship them like that. So what does he do? He doesn't hesitate. He's a yes parent. So he grabs all up the gold jewelry, <laughs> puts it in the furnace, makes the idol, makes it, carves it out. They worship it, and that's where God comes in. Yo, <laughs> They're going crazy, comes down the mountain, Moses drops the tablet, no Joshua, it's not cries of battle, they are engaging in pagan revelry. They're going crazy, worshiping this thing. He approaches his brother Aaron, Moses is like, what is up? Doubles down, you know how these people are, <laughs> I just melted their jewelry and out popped this calf. What? You know what I mean? Like, you ever stop on that one? It's weird. And like 3,000 people get killed. What? Oh. So here's the other side of it. Here we go. You ready? Okay. I'm going anyway. <laughs> here's where the members are wrong. Remember this. You asked for it. You asked for it. Think about it. Now, just, just a little side note, and I'm not, I'm not making excuses for Aaron, so don't, don't hear that, or any celebrity, but don't hear that. But understand what I'm saying here. I'm just going to just, I'm bringing you in on the inside of what happens with that ask, because there's a lesson that can be learned for leaders about the ask, but it's important for you guys to understand it, what sometimes you do. Kind of think about it, right? Thousands of people. Aaron's under a lot of pressure. Think about it. Like, let's just sympathize with him for a second. He's under a lot of pressure. That's what happens when pastors try to be politicians and make everybody happy. But the ask does something to the leadership. So there's both sides of this coin. And I can tell you as a worship leader, there's a lot of pressure there. A lot. Right? So some big, well, actually all of them. There's like a dress code at the big churches. Remember that? There's a dress code. There's a way you got to dress. You got to look a certain way because, you know, the mega church, there are people, they, they, you know, you got to wear the eunuch and then that creates another problem. So you need a scarf because you're wearing a eunuch. <laughs> skinny jeans, that's important. Sorry, Tony, you don't look good in skinny jeans. So, <laughs> <just teasing. laughs> but you wore them. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's what happens. He's here now, by the way. He corrected all of that. Right? So, and thank you for your service again, by the way, Deputy Johnson. You know what? Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I tease a lot. <laughs> but there's the other side of the coin. I love him. And he does a great service for our community, worth stopping and appreciating. I can remember practicing. And, you know, look, as a professional musician, that's what you got to do. You got to practice a lot. But, <laughs> but when you have a three-song set on a Sunday morning, no, no, you don't. But I did because I can't mess up. And so I found myself practicing my guitar more than I was in the Word. That's a problem if I'm standing here on this platform. That's a big problem. Spending all of my time playing, but not praying. That's a big problem, and it was a big problem. And you know what? The pastor and the meetings and the meetings and the meetings, I'm just going to let him off the hook for yelling at us sometimes. Because you know what? Now I know what it's like to have that many carnal meetings with people just asking you for stuff and why wasn't the worship team, we got to hire somebody, you know, and then they snap. 
You've been there. You guys, pastors yelled at the worship team right on the stage. You know what those meetings are like. It's horrible, though. How is this worship? The modern church has made modern rituals. It's just like Amos or Aaron. So it's the same pattern. The people ask the leaders, we want the golden calf. And the modern church has given it to them. They're all wrong. We have people worshiping the worship. That's it. You're worshiping the worship. Well, not you. If you get it, you get what I'm saying. Did you know <laughs> Jesus didn't have a worship team? <laughs> Think about it. Now, don't give me the whole Revelation 4 thing. Shut up. That's in heaven, the future. Calm down. I'm talking about when he came <laughs> in the physical body. He didn't have a worship team. But let's think about it. Like, let's say Jesus just, like, was behaving like a normal pastor. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Jesus goes up on the hill <laughs> to preach, right? And instead of that blessed are those stuff, like, he can't do it. He's like, how can I do this cold, man? Like, worship team, do your job. Philip, go to the town and get some worship leaders. I can't do it. They're cold, man. You got to warm, warm up their hearts so they can receive my message. They gotta, you got to charge up the batteries, man. Come on, worship team. Warm up the crowd for me. you got to stimulate them and get them ready for worship, right? they got to get their hearts right. The only way they can do that is if they sing songs or they hear really good music. <laughs> Said Jesus never. He didn't need it. The word of God is enough. <laughs> but the modern church has created a culture where they worship the worship. We are willing to pay untold sums of money or turn a blind eye for the worship that we don't need. But we don't like to send all that money to people who are in need. It's amazing. And it breaks my heart. So here's where I want to affirm some direction. I'm going to kind of let you guys in on just, just a few things. <laughs> if you came in here, maybe you, before you came in here, you saw some videos online, that kind of thing. The online ministry is really important. It really kind of is actually becoming missions here at C3 Church. There are people in India. I'm not joking. Everybody speaks English, apparently. Watching our videos, it amazes me. It amazes me. All over the world. And it's great. So, like, this is a live studio audience here, right? So, but it's really funny because I was talking about this kind of thing, right? And the media team's awesome. They make these like little one minute clips. That's the Instagram reel thing. You know, you, you do the one minute clips and it's fast. That's why I do have to like be presentable. If you see me after service, I'm going to get right out of these clothes. I don't like dressing like this, but I do it because I know kids, that's all they do, right? So I got like 0.5 less seconds. My, my daughter does this so fast. I'm like, I don't, how can you think, how can you process, are you processing this information? Like, I don't understand, but they do, right? So if, you know, you look sloppy or not respectable, they're not going to stop on you. That's just reality, right? So you got to do what you got to do. But this one guy was talking about celebrity pastors and churches, spending all this money, complaining, you know, about different things. And somebody posted a comment like, like, pastor, you should really like preach to yourself. Like, hey, look at you. I was like, what? I'm so detached from that because I can see the room. <laughs> like, I'm thinking there's like a hundred people at best here, you know. But then I looked at the video and I'm like, oh, like I can see how you might think that this is a really big church and that it's fancy. And Beth is like, yeah. <laughs> and some people come in and what did she say? She probably said something like, I thought it would be bigger, right? <laughs> 
If you thought something else, that's on you. Anyway, <laughs> I thought it would be bigger. Yeah, he really just said that. You know, but it was funny because the backdrop, <laughs> the backdrop, there were like the panels. Remember the panels? Yeah, you do. The panels were there. And like the guy, they look cool, right? They'd shine the lights on them and it looked like really fancy. But <laughs> it was styrofoam insulation. <laughs> That's what it was. And because they were so cheap, they kept like falling down. It looked like we were having earthquakes every Sunday. <laughs> it was terrible, right? So finally, I'm like, take them down. Like, I'm done dealing with this, chasing this problem. So this guy is looking at it, but he doesn't know. There's like, like half the room, it's like 100 people, maybe at best. I'm lying, it's less. So there's like nobody here. <laughs> it's a really small room, and we're a community church. But if they just see that and they hear that, they don't know. They don't get it. Like, it's literally styrofoam insulation budget. You know, basically, we try to do things, and like, I'm like, I don't know, ask Heather. And that's always the thing. And they're like, and she says, no, <laughs> no. Like, can you make it? Like, you know, <laughs> that's what we tried to do. It didn't work. It doesn't work all the time. But here's the thing. Here's where it does work. Here's where it does work. And now you and you, don't be mad at me. I'm going to take a swipe at Max. <laughs> Take a, really, it's not going to be a swipe. It's going to be a slap like that. Now, so here's the thing. If you want to have an iPhone and you want to waste your money, spend your money on it, <laughs> that's your business. I like nice things. I have nice things. And I waste a lot of money on those things, right? So that's fine when it's mine, right? It's my money. Okay, cool. But not when it's the church's money. That's not right. That's wrong. And so here's the thing. So a lot of you guys don't know that a lot of this product, all this, this stuff, not the screen, we got a new one, but anyway. And that was like, no, right? So we finally got, I, I convinced her, we need a big screen, we can show everybody movies. Anyway, but all the cameras and most of all the stuff, it was already here when we got here. We inherited it. We didn't pay for it. And we're so cheap that we're going to wait before we improve anything. It's old. It's like actually old. We're on 1080p, but we have good video people, right? So it doesn't look like that. And I'm going to wait until 8K gets really popular. Then we're going to go to 4K. Right? So we do it right. And that's how we do it. But the max, right? Where is he going with that? Well, if you go to a big church and you look like at their sound booth, you're going to see a bunch of max. Am I, can you say that again? That's right. <laughs> right. So anyway, don't hear that often. Anyway, lots of Macs. Lots of Macs. Why? I don't know. Because the big church uses them. So we got to use them. But here's the thing. We looked at getting, we needed new computers. And I was like, oh, no. Macs, that, like to run this stuff, that's like $5,000. No. <laughs> that's what happened. What do we do? Can we make them? Can't make a Mac. Yeah, but whatever. We don't need. Can you make a computer? Can you build one? Like you build? Yeah. People on the media team can do that. Apparently, how much? Five hundred bucks. I'm like perfect. We got yes, yes. We literally make some of the computers here. We do have some Macs. They were donated. We couldn't give them back. But anyway, we <laughs> we we. We make stuff here. We literally made computers. 500 bucks. That's better. It's a good use of your money, and some of you need to hear that this morning. We're good stewards, so you're lucky. You have a really cheap church administrator. So that's good. <laughs> so here's the other thing. Why do I keep doing that? <clears throat> here's the other thing. I've got to break that habit. It's a bad habit. You don't mind, do you, if we go a little over? Who's going to say yes? Manipulative. <laughs> anyway, you'll live. We have food. <sighs> People will come in here. I think, again, are we on the affirming part? Okay, we're good, right? No one's crying yet. I can't see anyway. The lights are in my eyes. But we're on the affirming part. Right, so let's, let's affirm as a church family, my family. Some people have come in here, and they're new. And they come in, and they go, where's the band? Where's the band? They freak out. Like, where's the worship team? I'm like, calm down. I'm like, no. Where's Moses? Make us a golden calf. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, listen. There's nothing wrong with a band. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> There's nothing wrong with a band. Would have been amazing. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. It's fine. But here's what I let people know. We're going to have a band when the Lord brings in a band. He hasn't. And here's the other little thing. Some of you know this if you've been in church for a little while. It's going to be two by two like Noah's Ark. Why would I want two of every kind? Let me explain this to you. If you've been in church for a while, you know why. So that nobody can hold the pastor hostage. That's why. I don't care how good you are and how people are worshiping you like a golden calf. If you're out there at your other gig, because apparently this isn't enough money for you, and you're engaging in pagan revelry, doing things that you shouldn't be doing, get out. You're off the stage. We don't need to listen to you sing lies anymore. That's happened, but not on my watch. That's why certain people aren't here anymore. Let's just rip that band-aid off. Doing crazy things. I can't have anyone singing lies here. That's just wrong. Two by two. So you got that question? Yup. We can have a band. But when we do, it'll be quality. You'll know they're not lying. And here's the other thing. Qualified people, but also qualified by the right heart. That's what matters. God hears the heart, not always your mouth. He's listening to your heart. That's the important thing. So it's kind of funny. One of the two worship leaders here on the stage, singers on the stage, is my daughter, so that tall Wookiee, the blonde Wookiee, and so there you go, <clears throat> it's a real thing. That's her boyfriend, I can't beat him up, so it's kind of difficult. <laughs> right. Anyway, okay, I'm going to get serious again, let's, let's get, come on. <laughs> so that's the thing. I can go to anybody singing on this stage. Like, they don't even want to sing, right? <laughs> but anyway, she does her vocal lessons during the week. She practices, right? She tries to get it right, and that's great. That's really honoring. But I could go, Sophie, you're not going to sing today. And she'd go, fine. You know what I mean? And just go on to, like, clean the garbage, any of the other ten tasks that the whole worship team does. You have singers that come here, they sing, they get on the camera. They don't care. But I've had people come into church. I, God told me to sing. You know, what? God didn't tell me that, you know, so no. You know, so it's just know that the people you see on the stage, they, they're here because they have the right heart. They're in leadership because they have the right heart. They're not because they don't, right? So it's fine. Not that you don't, but you get what I'm saying. And here's the other thing. The band is for beginners. The track is for beginners. That's going to tick a lot of people off. There's nothing wrong with the band. Again, there's nothing wrong with the track. And here's the thing. We want to meet the culture where it is. That's important. That's why I'm not up here showing you my hairy legs and the sandals that I'm going to change into after service, right? So I'm trying to, like, meet people where they are. I know where they're at. I'm trying to meet them there. And it's just a quick, funny story. Like, <laughs> we came in as business people, right? And so we come from New York where everything's pretty much negative. So just that. And as we come to Southwest Florida, we're scared. She has people following her out to the car with the grocery bags, and she's like, Someone's trying to kill me. You know, like they just want to put the groceries in your car. But like, you know, she's like, kicks them. <laughs> like, get out of here. But we're not used to that kind of thing. It was weird. It was a whole conversation. Like people keep following me around everywhere I go. They're trying to be nice most of the time. But still be careful. You know, keep the gun on you. Anyway, <laughs> same thing. We're like finding radio stations. And like we didn't know. Here's the thing. We're listening to Christian radio. We didn't know that. Because right? I, I don't think they have that in New York. It's not a thing. So, you know, maybe they do. I don't know. But we're listening to Christian. We don't know it, right? So we're having these separate conversations. And I think it was stupid me who went to her first and said, man, I, got, I found this radio station. They're so positive. 
Every, they're so nice. They don't ever say anything mean. It's weird, right? So we started church. We came into church, and we heard one of those songs. I'm like, that's the song from the, oh, Christian radio station. <laughs> like, I had no idea, right? So it serves a purpose, doesn't it? And that's why. But here's the thing. So we welcome you. Come as you are, but don't stay as you are. I'm going to stay as you are. And so as you grow, like me, I enjoy the music. I love it. I think it's great. It Help them with the sound and stuff. I love it. But I don't need it. I don't need it. And that's the thing. We saw an example of this, mature biblical worship in Jonah. People skip that whole part of the story, all of chapter 2. It's only four chapters. They take 25% of the story away. But it's really important. It's that whole chapter for a reason. What happened? He's in the belly of the sea monster, the whale, the fish, whatever. Don't get hung up on that. Get hung up on this. That dude was in a horrible place, getting all burned up by the acid in the sea monster's stomach. And what did he do? He prayed. But not just that. It's like a psalm. I told you. He's worshiping. He's worshiping in the fish worshiping. Not just Old Testament either. New Testament, Acts 16, Paul, Silas, Philippi. They meet Lydia, first European convert, a woman, by the way, kind of interesting. Right? So then they're there, and there's this girl with the spirit of divination. Maybe your Bible says. She's like a fortune teller. Spirit of Pythona in Greek, and that would take too long to explain, so I'm not going to do that. You're welcome. Anyway, <laughs> no, please do. The Spirit, and she's annoying Paul. She's saying the truth. Right? These are the servants of the Most High God, but Paul gets annoyed for some reason after a few days of this. Well, that could be annoying. So he casts the evil spirit out of her, but her owners are really mad because they can't make money off of her anymore. So they drag them to court, and they have them beaten with rods, and they throw them in prison, not just prison, but like the inner dungeon of the prison. Horrible place. So you just imagine, like, seated in an uncomfortable position, the stocks and chains and stuff like that. You've just been beaten with rods. It's probably cold and damp, no window. It's not good. But they're not like, can't worship because there's no worship team. No. They worship around midnight. They worship, and it brings the house down. There's an earthquake. They're freed from their chains. The doors open up. It seems that the most genuine worship comes not in our time of comfort, but in our time of crisis. We shouldn't need these things to stimulate our emotions in order to worship. And we have to be really careful with that. <laughs> We've built a culture where we too, as a church, are suffering from a famine of the word of the Lord. Amos 8.11, the time is surely coming, says the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea and wander from border to border, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. Beautiful girls and strong young men will grow faint in that day, thirsting for the word of the Lord. Lord's word. The modern church has brought that upon itself by inserting too much of the world and not enough of the word. So what does this say, the word say that worship is? Romans 12, 1. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. That's how we worship. 
The rest of it is just an extension. It's just an outpouring. But did you see that? Don't, don't, don't be conformed to the customs of this world. Be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit so that if you find yourself in a prison cell, you can worship. You're equipped. If the tracks go down at C3, you can worship. You're equipped. Transformed, not conformed. But too many churches have conformed themselves to the world in their worship. Hebrews 13, 15. Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, unceasing not just for 15 minutes on Sunday, proclaiming our allegiance to his name, and don't forget to do good and share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please, please God. This is our worship. We are saved by grace through our faith in Jesus Christ. But our works are our worship. Again, singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, Colossians 3.16, Ephesians 5.19. I get it. It's all okay. I said it's good. It's an extension. But the key to those verses is making melody in your hearts to God. It's all about having our heart right. And that is true worship. Lord, I thank you for this time, for this church, everyone's willingness to listen, to participate, to be a part of what we're doing here at your church, according to your will and your word. We love you, Lord. Continue to keep us humble to embrace your spirit so that as we go out, we are true vehicles of your love, your peace, your mercy, your grace, your kindness, so that more would come to you. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.